it's 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 really good to gather and also reflect on where legal reporting is today uh, i remember when i started possibly my first interaction about the law with broader public on social media my handle on twitter used to be apar at bar and a lot of people didn't get that joke right it was a pun on the court uh, for the legal bar right they used to think that i'm a drunkard <laughs> yeah so uh, i changed it to my birth year but Uh, what i remembered around that time was that legal commentary news from the courts was something which is frowned upon and this has to do a little bit about how the legal institution itself and i don't mean the courts i also mean the lawyers and the entire system by itself how it intersects prevents transparency fetters access to the general public and today when i look at it it's it's so different and a large part of it has to do with live streaming live tweeting reports dedicated portals and the growth of public interest in discovering how our courts function not only the judgments that they pronounce and with this i come first to you manu manu in a recent article uh, in terms of a retrospective on uh, the entire term of uh, justice lalit uh, you stated that when justice uday umesh lalit assumed office as the 49th chief justice of india on august 27th many would have thought that his state uh, his term would be a sedate one but by proving all such speculations wrong cgi lalit's term was marked with momentous and unexpected events which unfolded at a quick place so you're writing this on live law and you're publishing this are the primary readers or the audience who's reading this lawyers who is this written for live law is read by uh, there is a lot of audience for live law and and also for other legal portals and if you see the uh, twitter portals twitter handles of live law and other legal portals like you would see that uh, there are like lakhs of followers and these are not just lawyers and just just with lawyers and judges you can't have so much followers and so much readership so legal reporting is not consumed by lawyers and judges alone it's now consumed by the larger public there's a lot of uh, greater public interest in court developments and judicial happenings these days and uh, like from the comments and the responses which we get on a daily basis most of these co- comments and queries come from general public and not just lawyers so that is something so uh, i believe that uh legal journalism is catering to a wider audience it's not just to a legal i mean not just to the legal fraternity so in that sense so i think this is coupled with the general interest with the which, which the people are feeling which the people are having towards court developments and judicial uh, happenings because courts have now become a uh, i would say some some kind of a new battlefield on a lot of uh, different issues on political issues ideological issues so people are looking forward to courts what is happening there and the court developments and the uh, the outcomes of the judicial pronouncements they are impacting general public also so it's not something which is very academic so earlier if you used to see uh, the coverage of courts used to be about judgments and and that also used to be happen very rarely and but now these days if you see most of the front page news is about court court news and not just uh, judgments court hearings and court exchanges these things so uh we are so so we also realized that so when live law started we started initially as a platform which is uh, reporting judgments for lawyers that was the initial uh, framework of live law but gradually we also realized that even in a manner which we could never imagine that our coverage has increased and a lot of people are reading live law and they are not just lawyers so we then we realized that we have to uh, adopt a different strategy also we have to uh, change our reporting style we have to simplify it because most of the like when live law started uh, all of our all of us were from legal background not from journalistic background then we realized that since uh, our audience are a general audience we have to adopt a different strategy we have we have to use simpler language we have to br- break down the judgments and we have to explain the impact of the judgment to the people so that shift happened so just a small follow up question in the live law team are there lawyers who become journalists or there are journalists who also become lawyers <laughs> it's mostly like primarily lawyers but who don the role of journalists also that oh wow <laughs> uh now uh quickly coming to you gautam uh i think 
a large part of your writing uh, has been through the Indian uh, uh, constitutional and philosophy blog, and I remember you starting it actually. I remember you tweeting it out, and uh, I think you took it on as a challenge, if I'm not wrong, because it was being stated that the uh, arena of blogging was dead, or the it had all shifted towards social media. In terms of the kind of writing that which is done on academic blogs, do you think it has an intersection with journalism? And do you think lawyers by themselves, the minute we say that, and I know there's a fair degree of public engagement which we do invite, why are we at the same time so uncomfortable saying that maybe we are also in our legal writing speaking truth to power? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, the question is interesting and I think it, has to do with the very specific way in which the Indian courts function. And in that sense, legal blogging in India is fundamentally different from legal blogging in other countries. Because when I began the blog, I was inspired by the culture of legal blogging primarily in the US, where you have SCOTUS blog, and you have other blogs like balkanization and so on. Uh, and the purpose is that you analyze judgments. Right? And you, you extract the reasoning, you critique, and so on. And in that sense, I think you are basically ex extending your role as a lawyer into you know, the legal writing sphere. With the Indian courts, actually, if you just look at the judgments, you'll be missing out on a whole lot. Right? There's so much that happens in court that is not reflected in the judgment. So much of impact takes place through interim orders, one-line interim orders. The refusal to give a stay, which will be a very innocuous one-line order, actually will make a massive difference to people's fundamental rights. And up till a certain amount of time, uh, actually, uh, and this has now changed, thankfully, but journalists weren't allowed to go up to the front, right? So they had to go at the car, stand at the back. And therefore, a lot that would be almost like a bench bar dialogue, all of, and the mics weren't there earlier, right, in soft voices, if you're at the back, you you can't you literally can't hear that. Um, and so in that sense, uh, 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 just by virtue of being a lawyer and, and being given this quite, I think, undeserved privileged access where you're at the front and you're listening to what's happening, uh, would then give you an insight into what is going on in a way that just judgment would not. And I think in that sense, for a while at least, um, legal blogging was a bit like journalism in part. And I think it's a good thing that now it's changed because I think now journalists can go up to the front, can carry phones, mics are being used. Can live tweet. Can, can live tweet, yeah. So live tweeting, of course, we can, we can talk about live tweeting like I think at some yeah, point. At, at we, some point we'll talk about that yeah, separately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think that's now changed for the better. And then that's something that I think bloggers are now again can focus on, you know, sort of analyzing judgments and of course interim orders, but need not take on, you know, the burden of journalism, which frankly we're not competent to do. Like there are qualified people who can do that, so. And uh, Apurva, I think accessibility is something which shows through your work every time I read a news report. This is one recent one by her. And I'm quoting, in a high court not very far away, empires of the academic publishing world are fighting to caution insurgency by, quote, rogue websites and, quote, the Robin Hood of science. What's at stake is free access to a galaxy of research and literature in the science and social sciences and the outcome may have international ramifications. So when you, when, it's been a few years for you in terms of journalism. What have, what's, what's been driving this passion towards making legal journalism or what's happening in the courts much more accessible for the broader public? What, 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 what drives you? Who's your audience? Thank you for that question, Abar, and you've really done your homework, I see, for all of us. You're quoting us now. So, um, see, for me personally, I began with live law. Um, of course, as a lot of people know, I started with, uh, while I was still in law school, just to answer your question about what drives me, and then I'll touch the accessibility bit, maybe. Uh, so, I began while I was still in law school. Live law was still maybe five, six months old. It was still, um, you know, really new. Uh, this is back in 2014, if I'm not wrong. So it was still pretty young. And I sort of saw that phenomena 
um, you know, rise of, of course, we've always, if you look at newspapers, if you look at TV channels, legal beat has always been there. We've had quite a few big legal journalists who've been covering the courts for years. We've had Mr. B. Venkatesh, and we have quite a few legal journalists. What happened in the past few years, though, is a different phenomena. It's about, uh, firstly, a lot of lawyers coming together, like Gautam mentioned, because, I mean, using their accessibility to, to courts and trying to bring it to people. And that really opened the doors of the courts to show the sort of action that happens inside. And there's a lot of action that does happen inside. So I think that's that's where I really started my journey from. Why I moved to the print after that, after a few years, was a, my idea was moving to a more mainstream audience. Of course, Live Law also has a mix of uh, different sorts of audience. But my idea was just moving to a more mainstream audience because I think that there's still a certain gap between law and the people. And that accessibility is what I want to really work on. And that's not just because of the language that the law uses. That's one thing, of course. And there's a thin line, I understand, because you, while you do want to make things interesting for people, which is what I was trying to do in that article, because it was about Sci-Hub and Libgen, the entire uh, controversy. And I wanted to tell people how important that case is. That's just. Uh, a petition that's pending in the Delhi High Court, but it has massive ramifications and not many people were talking about it, but I wanted people to know about it. And I think that's where my idea of journalism comes from, that I want to take, bring this entire opportunity that's been given to me through courts opening, through live streaming, through uh, even live tweeting, through just courts becoming more accessible and taking that to people, you know, because that's where the interaction happens, I feel, with the Constitution and the law. It's not just within the courts, it's on the streets that interaction happens. It's on a news website that people interact with the law. And that's how it, I mean, if it impacts them, they should know about it. So now that I know a little bit about all three of your journeys, let me start putting, also when this accessibility is also put to a certain kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, and this arouses a sensorial instinct in me and I when I see my YouTube uh, pop up this lawyer apologized to that judge and it, I know it's clickbait because it's an exchange and we've seen live streaming happen for some time what has been your experience with now not as journalists who mediate the information which goes from a court to the wider public thereby adding context thereby adding comprehension to directly live streams being there? Is it actually beneficial in terms of the transparency? And of course, if there are benefits, what are the risks which are emerging now that it is happening for some time and there are dedicated channels which are clipping live streams? So I'll start with you, Apurva. Sure, so you're actually right and I actually wrote an article on this as well because it was just such a different phenomena again that was happening. I suddenly saw these YouTube channels that had just come up a few months ago, but they had like lakhs of followers, okay? And all they had were YouTube shorts. It was meme content. Judges and lawyers were meme content. There were these YouTube short videos with uh, captions reading, uh, judge ne aaj uh, SHA ko fatkar lagai, yahan dekhe. You know, stuff like that. And they had lakhs of views. I was like, I need to, how do they have lakhs of views? But people are interested in these things. Plus, coming to the uh, point of them, you know, actually increasing accessibility, for sure, that is definitely happening. Because again, then, you know, just to understand what was exactly happening, who was watching these videos. I remember going, Gujarat High Court was the first High Court to start live streaming on YouTube. And I remember going to the first video that Gujarat High Court uploaded, October 2020, if I'm not wrong, which is when they started it during COVID. And I just went through the comments on that video. They, it, of course, uh, uh, has YouTube like, comments. YouTube comments. I wow. go through every comment your, of your mine prayer. as well. Yeah, I, I do it. Uh, so anyway, I get a lot of good feedback. We can talk about that later. But so I was going through the comments and, you know, people are surprised out of their minds. Okay, there are, I remember comments reading where people are saying, you know, I'm a CA and this is the first time I'm actually seeing how a court functions. I mean, lucky for them that they've never been inside a courtroom before, but still they need to know what the experience is like, right? And people were really surprised. They were like, Hame laga tariq pe tariq hota, which still happens, but you know, you know what I mean? Like their idea of a courtroom was very Bollywood and live streaming actually managed to change that and people are watching those live streams. They're binging on it. This is 
this is netflix content right there people are really watching it so manu i'll come to you now uh, i think a lot of people have opinions about the law and they should right now this with all this live streaming happening how are, how is live law which is a dedicated news platform aiming to add value or changing its media strategy to play the function of journalism around it or has it been considered inside your editorial uh, decisions even with uh, live streaming happening uh, so we also had this uh, discussion within our newsroom so what could be the impact of live streaming in legal reporting and what we could observe was that even with live streaming the audience the uh, traffic in our site the readership that was even increasing for example uh, the live, the major live streaming hearing happened in uh, in a high court like gujarat high court started but a major case which got live streamed first which had national interest was the hijab case hearing in karnataka so that was being why like, is that of course i mean the hijab issue no, uh, was the was the what if you notice the hijab case by itself being live streamed by itself what was happening around it in terms of in terms of national attention I, of course i, I mean hijab was a, a lot of layers in that that issue and of course i mean it's very obvious why hijab issue is a very national issue and so uh, and the the karnataka high court they had a youtube site uh, they used to live stream all the all the court proceedings so the hijab hijab matter also got live stream i mean it's not that just for hijab matter they started live streaming live streaming was there always so uh, when the live streaming was happening we were also live tweeting and our tweets also tweets were also getting a lot of engagement and our reports were also getting a lot of engagement so that was kind of a, an eye opener for us even even when the video content is there people are also interested in reading about it what is happening because everyone may not be in a position to watch the entire video you, you have a point on this yeah, may i just add to that i also feel like journalists do have a very special vantage point when it comes to um reporting on cases because of course it's been live stream but there's more context to what's happening plus i feel like if people are also watching legal arguments happen in a very specific way that not everybody understands we feel like people are, might understand that but uh, that's not necessarily to true a lot of words that are used terminologies that are used so for adding that context to actually understand what's happening in the courts i feel like um, you know that's when people go to live law or come to the print or to read me it, they still are interested and in also it. regarding the uh, you had put this question to apurva like what are the uh, what are the effects of uh, live streaming and has it really helped our or is it making court proceeding some kind of a tamasha some kind of an entertainment that aspect is there like you can see a lot of youtube shorts and reels instagram reels made out of courtroom proceedings and that that aspect is there but on the other hand i feel that uh, live streaming that is very educative and uh, people are there are there are a section of people who are taking it very seriously and uh, which we had we saw this during the ews case hearing a lot of like lakhs of viewers were there for the ews case hearing and serious audience and they were like closely watching it maharashtra. the maharashtra case also the shivasena case also like uh, if you see the uh, youtube count the i mean not just the supreme court site many youtube channels were streaming the uh, the hearing and if you see the viewer count there are like lakhs of viewers for each video each day's video and you were telling me a little earlier that they are very engaged conversations act, act, yes e even in a, when we are live tweeting the proceedings also when we see the comments and the retweets and the court tweets and people are like very minutely following the hearing and they are not lawyers they are people from other backgrounds but they are very closely watching the proceedings they know what was the question like uh, for example uh, cji made a comment uh, immediately came the replies like cji made a contrary comment the last day and now he's asking a different question to the other side and what is the like they are closely discussing and analyzing the answers and the proceedings and it's really like you know uh, from a very uh, onlooker point of view it's very interesting to see like i am watching it in a very uh, somewhat like a like, like kind of a spectator what is happening and uh, it's very very instructive also because people who are not like if you see the shivsena case i mean the hearings are like about 10 schedule and a lot of constitutional issues it might appear very dry and technical but people know what could be the real real world political impact of these uh, arguments people are aware of that 
and these life uh, the extensive reporting and coverage it has in one way educated the people it has made people aware about the impact of court proceedings so uh, that aspect is there i i'm conscious of that uh, negative aspect of uh, this courtroom proceedings being made into some kind of a tamasha kind of thing that that is there but on the other hand when we see the positive side uh, it is a very educative step in that sense and people are getting uh, they are getting more aware about the courtroom proceedings and they are also getting educated about the proceedings so uh, i think picking up from the point about impact one other area i think which was uh, which was discussed fairly broadly in terms of resisting live streaming and greater mediatization of the court came from the impact on the judges and the judicial system itself and i'll take this to you gautam in terms of creating constituencies which can lobby the court by itself and i remember this because uh, it was it emerged quite organically around the 66a case and i was a lawyer around that time and even at that time there's a person here who warned me about the consequences who said that possibly apart this may lead to factions being created which may lobby courts through a greater media interaction which may not only be one way yeah i think that um, that that is a, is a really great question and again goes to some of i think the pathological features of of indian of indian courts uh, because the the threat or the problem that you're highlighting in 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 other systems where you have live tweeting live streaming there is an internal check to that which is the language of the law right so if you look at for example the supreme court of kenya which you know where the constitutional cases are live broadcast um you know over many days and south africa all those places um there is still you know a certain kind of uh, expected way in which lawyers and judges interact which makes it difficult to you know take a clip out of context and then use it to say fuel something yes. because you're still bound to a certain kind of legal language that resists that kind of sensationalization right so like the maharashtra case right if you are arguing 10 schedule right like you will are you in a language and in a in a vocabulary that you know if someone snips it what will they get from it right like yes. some this case said this so and so right the problem is that in our courts now that has long been gone um and uh, specifically with respect to certain lawyers right um who bring cases which are designed to fuel certain kinds of passions now again if you're looking at the us or south africa or kenya those kinds of cases will be filtered out at the beginning they'll be filtered out in written submissions or whatever so you'll never get to court to for example for example recently right recently someone brought to court a case saying that uh, legislate the ucc right um now if someone tried that in the us or kenya or south africa you wouldn't ever get to court it will be dismissed in chambers so there's no there's no question of somebody going to court in grandstanding saying my lords like implement the ucc the court saying no and then that being you say oh look at this court this court actually is pro muslim pro christian that's why they're not gotham you know, yeah. one question which quite often comes yeah. to us and by us i do mean us yeah okay specifically it's not a wig yeah. is that you have a political bias yeah your proce- your 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 prefacing a certain kind of progressive agenda towards the court yeah and which is why you believe in a certain kind of report and analysis and you think another kind is just picking up from your words not because they are your words because they are the right words inflaming passions do you think that there's an underlying constitutional basis to the function of journalism to the function of analysis and how it interacts with the judiciary is that basis and this is a leading question now progressive no so i think that here so i think that here's the thing right so if you look at the court right so there is a distinction between a judgment of the court right that is delivered after arguments in a final hearing and between say a monday sl a special leave petition right that comes to court for admission right which could be a completely absurd kind of a case it's like this ucc implementation and thirdly a comment coming from a judge in the course of a back and forth these are three very dis- distinct things and a very distinct in the way that they operate i think the problem is that certain kind of of self proclaimed say reporting on the court 
deliberately conflates these two things, right? So for, again, for instance, right? So recently, this uh, um, this case involving hate speech, right? So in Justice Joseph's court, right? Now something is going on, and uh, and uh, he basically asked uh, the one of the lawyers that, "Do you know who Periyar is?" You know, and he smiled, right? Because there was sort of an absurd thing, right? Like you know, the quoting Periyar, "Do you know who Periyar is?" Right? Innocuous, off the cuff, back and forth in court. Now that was spun into like entire article saying that Justice Joseph of the Supreme Court justifies genocide of like X or Y, right? Now I think that that isn't the question of a progressive agenda or like, you know, I think it's just like misreporting, right? So you are taking away the context. This was a back and forth between lawyers and judges. Often judges like and lawyers say things in a back and forth that are off the cuff, right? This is not a judgment of the court. This is not even an order of the court. It is literally a, literally like, you know, an off-the-cuff remark in a certain context. But now that is then you say, oh, this the Supreme Court is institutionally anti-so-and-so, anti-so-and-so. And then that adds to like, you know, a prior confirmation bias the Supreme Court is, you know, woke or like anti-this, anti-that. Right? So I think like the problem is that you're dealing, I think this is the issue because again, I, and this again, this hate speech case, right? The way it came to court, it would not come to court in this way in another country. There would be like a pleading, a response. There would be a date. You fix a date for hearing. And then the lawyers would come and they would argue in their turn. There wouldn't be this sort of free for all where one lawyer says, you know, look at what's happening in this state. Other lawyers say, but why aren't you looking at Kerala? Right? So that, that isn't the way courts are supposed to function. And this, this, this is not the way they function elsewhere. And I think because they have become like this in India, uh, this is why you have a situation where the dark side of, of live streaming or of live tweeting has become this. Uh, because the discourse in the courtroom uh, has lost that internal guardrail that would act as a check against it being used to then inflame like you know passions or inflame certain kinds of I'm I'm conscious we have been talking only about the Supreme Court and this is maybe my own bias speaking I've spoken a lot on this right all of us have spoken a lot so I also want to understand uh, especially from you Apurva like how are legal journalism how is legal journalism looking at the district courts now as capacity grows, as public interest grows. Actually, you're right, because that's another aspect. When you talk about accessibility, I feel like that's extremely important that we don't just look at, say, the Supreme Court or the Delhi High Court or the Bombay High Court. We do look at what's happening in the trial courts, what's happening in the districts, because that, that's where the law is, where that's where the procedure is being applied, right? That's where the law is actually taking a form and being uh, implemented, so to say. So, uh, I mean, of course, then we there are uh, logistical issues that come in there because um, we can't possibly have a journalist in every district in the country. But then uh, I feel personally, and that's what I try to do, is I take a very conscious effort to then look at those quotes, look at what they're doing. For example, just um, when you talk about death penalty jurisprudence, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, we, of course, talk about the guidelines that are coming from the Supreme Court, about what the Supreme Court is saying on how sentencing should be done, whether they're taking a relook. But it's the trial courts that are giving out those sentences. How are they exactly doing it? And it's important to have that sort of analysis, I think. And it's like I said, it's a conscious effort to keep trying and bringing those stories out as well. And You know, one, one thing which I also wanted to uh, understand is that uh, from you, Manu, now, uh, in terms of how are you choosing the cases to report on? Is this distinction Supreme Court, High Court, Lower Court also playing or it should touch upon an area of pre-existing interest? What, how are these editorial decisions quite often being made? See, of course, uh, there would be some cases of constitutional importance and public law importance would be there. And there would be some cases involving public personalities, for example, politicians or uh, other celebrities or so, uh, and also like cases involving substantial questions of law. So we would be, and also there are like uh, important PILs to be covered, like PILs uh, addressing issues of marginalized sections and uh, various other issues. Various other issues which may not, uh, which may not get a platform in the parliament or in the legislative assemblies because they are not political vote banks. But these people, they have only the court to raise their issues. 
So we need to, so we have, we have taken a very conscious decision to give maximum coverage to PILs, which highlight social, re, socially relevant issues. Uh, for example, recently, the, like last day, there was one case. I mean, the case was dismissed, actually. Uh, there was a clarification petition filed in the NARSA judgment, uh, like seeking, seeking a clarification that the reservation for transgender persons, that should be horizontal. Like there's a confusion whether it, whether it should be applied horizontally or vertically. And nothing really happened in the case. The bench said that it's already disposed of case. We can't issue a clarification. The case was dismissed. I mean, dismissed and they were given liberty to file a fresh petition. So in terms of hearing proceedings, nothing happened. The order also says nothing. But we thought that, okay, this is an issue which should be highlighted. People should know about this. People should know why this demand for horizontal and vertical reservation. I mean, what is the difference? Many people are still not aware what could be the implications. So we wrote a like detailed article about uh, what is the case about, what is the impact. So these kind of issues also we need to highlight. So it's not just uh, cases of politicians and also like there could be high profile cases. Those also we should report. But certain issues which may not get coverage in mainstream media and which may not get raised in political platforms or legislative platforms, we also need to highlight that. Uh, Gautam, uh, just like to, uh, uh, b before one final round of questions, which I'll do fairly quickly, it's a short question, just like to ask you also, as a lawyer, when you were live tweeting, and possibly that was the most visible instance of live tweeting, I think that was the Aadhaar case by itself, which started it, uh, what was the reaction of the legal community? And I think it's important for us to document this today. <laughs> given that live tweeting is an accepted example. So it's good to go back and think where we may have gone wrong. Yeah, so live tweeting... You can even mention what was my reaction. <laughs> was I very supportive or how was I not? I think, I think you were a little skeptical. Uh, no, I think live, live tweeting began way before that. 20, I think the first... My first memory of live tweeting is the, is the cautional judgment, 377 judgment in 2013. Because I was abroad and I remember following it on, on live tweets. And then Shreya Singhal was like, I think it really caught on Aadhaar PAN because a lot of people were very anxious because they didn't want to link their PAN cards and they didn't know what was happening in court. And suddenly, you know, uh, there were, were live tweets. And um, I think that was where it really sort of became like a big thing because people were tuning in to, to, to see what was happening. I think the... Uh, the there was a very interesting incident. Somebody was reading those live tweets, right? There were many people who were reading those. There's those one person tweets. who was particularly the day of the judgment, I think. <laughs> there were many who were, who were reading them, uh, you know, and we were involved in the case. Um, and yeah, I think it was a bit mixed. So I think some people, were, some lawyers were very, so I remember, for example, that um, one of Mr. Sham Divan's uh, juniors was quite happy. He was saying that, you know, uh, the arguments have to go out because these are very important arguments. And, and you know, without someone taking them out of the courtroom, people would understand what the case is about. Uh, so, uh, so you know, they they have to they have to go out. I think there was there was skepticism as well. Uh, again, I think primarily on the basis that the you're you're basically I mean, Twitter is sort of a very specific medium, right? And and it is it, designed to to always uh, by its very nature accelerate, antagonize, uh, create a situation where everything seems like a zero sum game. And when you try and reduce like complex legal arguments to bite-sized 240 character summaries, there is there is something that can be lost in translation, right? And I, I'll give you an example, quite a funny example. Um, during arguments in one of the cases, one of the lawyers, I wouldn't mention who it was, um, he says that, um, you know, you may want to be forgotten, but the state will not forget you, right? And, and what, what his point was, right? His point actually, and to be fair to him, what his point was that in terms of welfare, you know, like the state will not, you know, just because you want to, you know, secede, the state will still take Live care of you. Live in a cave, I think that. Yeah, 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 right? So the state will still take care of you as, as a welfare state, right? But when it comes out as a live feed, right? So-and-so argues, you may want to be forgotten. The state will not forget you. It sounds like the most sinister, evil <laughs> servant state, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't his intention, you know, to be fair to him. And the next day, you know, the newspapers are saying like, you know, so-and-so says, you know, the state will not forget you. So I think in that sense, um, there is a certain context to court, court uh, exchanges, which you can understand the nuance if you're in court. But when the written, it's in, it's in written form, something can get lost. And I think there was skepticism because of that. Uh, uh, Gautam, I'll stop you there because I have just two fi one final question, two sentences. If journalism is speaking truth to power, what is jo legal journalism speaking truth to? Or who? See, I believe uh, it's about making our courts accountable and transparent. 
And uh, when you have, uh, because see, we don't have any institutional mechanism to ensure accountability of judiciary. So judiciary is basically, uh, it's, it's an institution which is uh, founded upon public trust and public confidence. And it's about a perception. So when public can form that perception only if they have that raw material of what is happening in the court. And also commentators like, for example, Gautam, he comments and he criticizes and analyzes uh, courtroom proceedings. He also requires that raw material of what is happening. So we are providing that raw material of what is happening in the court, what is the news, what was the exchange. And so we are finding a meaning in that service. So that is something uh, which I believe. And also one more thing I, I would like to add. We are also creating a record of what happened in the courtroom. For example, like uh, a lot of arguments and a lot of things which happen in the courtroom, they don't, they don't get recorded in the judgment. And so there has to be a public record for many things. Now, uh, recently the Supreme Court has started this uh, practice of uh, publishing the live transcripts. But that is only a recent development. Uh, for example, in the EWS case, a lot of things were said. Everything is not getting discussed in the judgment. Uh, Dr. Mohan Gobal, he was one of the lead counsels. So he actually, he told me that uh, he was very happy with the reports and tweets and everything. So he said that like they were quite sure about what, what was going to the verdict. They were actually surprised that there was a descent of threes to two. And he said that most of the arguments were uh, raised for posterity. For, so that a future generation can understand and can understand and can analyze what happened. And also uh, a lot of things were said so that a wider people, court was used as a platform to appeal to a wider population, a general audience, to make them understand what, was, what were the issues with the EWS system. And so by reporting that, we are creating a record for posterity. So that is also another service which I believe we are doing. Apoorva, I'll take the same question to you. Actually, plus one to whatever Manu said, I do agree with uh, what he's trying to say. Plus for me, in addition to whatever he said, like he said, it's about record keeping, accountability, transparency. It is about taking those facts and presenting them to the people, at least for me, presenting them to the people for them to form an opinion then themselves. But they need to be shown the uh, entire picture. For example, if you're talking about, say, a law like POXO, you can't show people the entire picture by just talking about one judgment or just the parties or the courts. There's the CWC, there's, there's the families involved, there are support persons, and that's what will give them the complete picture. So that's one, and also about taking the law to the people. Like I said, I might sound like a broken record by now, but it is for me, it is about taking them to the people in as many forms as possible. You like stories, articles, I'll give them to you. Like videos, I'll give them to you. you like. Okay, not English videos and Hindi. In fact, you know, I started doing Hindi videos because, uh, so I come from Kanpur. Uh, I'm the first uh, person to actually go out and study and I did my law. And I started making these videos for starting with live law and then went on to the print. And my mother would watch all my videos. She can't understand English. She'd always watch them, okay, always. So my point, then that's when I sat down and I thought that, okay, then, but there is an audience beyond that English audience, right? There is a wide audience there that wants to get to know about the law, that needs to know how the law is impacting them, how courts are impacting them. So fine, I will sit down and it'll take me a bit longer. I've never studied law in Hindi, but I'll make videos in Hindi as well. So for me, it's that, that bridging that gap as much as possible, as much in my as much as possible in my capacity. So uh, we have very little time. We've run over, actually. So I will just be taking about two questions now. Uh, please feel free to prompt certain questions. Good evening to the panel. I'm Sahanubhuti Krishnan, an undergraduate student at DU pursuing journalism. And I'm planning to take law further and further going into the field of legal journalism. So how do you feel and what suggestions you'll have, uh, will you give to me as or students, I have many friends in pursuing journalism currently will take up law further. So what, uh, do, how do you see the, this field soaring in future and what are your suggestions? See, I believe uh, legal journalism is still in its uh, nascent stage and its uh, peak is yet to be achieved. So there is a lot of scope for legal journalism and uh, as Apurva and Apar were mentioning, the present coverage is only confined to Supreme Court and the uh, high courts in the big metros and cities and what is happening in the Mofusil areas and the lower courts, 
that is completely unknown to the public. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of blind spot is there in legal journalism. A lot of areas are yet to be covered. And as for suggestions, I've uh, see uh, you may you may be a good lawyer, but that by itself may not make you a good journalist. So uh, you need to have a good sense of law as well as a good sense of news. And what is news? And news is not just uh, anything which is catering to public interest. Uh, Deepika Padukone's wedding or like what she wore in the wedding, that might be an interest of, that that might generate public in, public interest. But that is not, so, uh, death of a manual scavenger might be a more relevant issue. So we need to highlight issues and we need to uh, understand how law and how the court system is impacting public. We need to make them aware about that. So we need to, so that sense should be cultivated. That is something which I feel. Uh, hello to the panel. I'm Medha. I'm currently pursuing political science honors from Janaki Devi Memorial College to you. So I have a question because, ma'am, you talked about accessibility. A lot of times what actually happens is that all the judgments that is taking place in the courtrooms, a lot of times it do affect, I mean, most of the times it affects the marginalized sections who actually do not have access to even social media in the first place or even Hindi, like you're saying, because, you know, English and Hindi, a lot of regional language is, is not considered. So don't you think like uh, an effort should be made in that matter that, you know, judgments are available and it's more broken, you know, broken down in terms of language too. Because, you know, what terminologies, even if I as a student can understand, people from that community don't understand. And that is about them. So, you know, if I am actually, uh, you know, fighting for them, they should be actually you know, able to understand it better. So if you could just, you know, highlight, um, tell about that, that how can we overcome this obstacle? No, absolutely, you're right. I agree with that, which is why I was talking about the constraints that we often face. Um, I mean, we try to do as much as we can in terms of uh, taking the law to the people, making them understand what their rights are. But I also feel this is also about an intersection between how we, say, interact with uh, not just other journalists, but with the civil society who has maybe inroads. So it's a lot about that. Plus, I, I agree. I mean, uh, we've spoken about Twitter a lot here, but that's that's also drilled into my head through my newsroom that we have to always tell ourselves that Twitter is not our world. It's a bubble a lot of times. Not everybody is on Twitter, so we need to get off it and then write. And, you know, that is where the interaction also comes uh, into the picture. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And we just wish that we can do more in that aspect for sure. So one final, final, final question from there, because I've done two years there. Hello, my name is Rishika Singh and I'm pursuing uh, journalism and mass communication from WIPS Delhi. So my question was from the whole panel that sometimes uh, legal journalism spirals into being media trial. Like we have seen that people start making opinion and they are like that this is correct. This makes a particular party very weak and the other one very strong. So like what's like how do you ignore it and uh, like what's the solution for that? Like people, the media platform use it as a weapon actually against like uh, if there is a particular p political party involved. So they try to suppress this or make a particular, uh, you know, opinion and it creates a propaganda. So how uh, as a legal journalist, if you are a like honest legal journalist, how you ignore it? Okay, so that's a wider media accountability issue. Uh, if I can just weigh in here, I think, uh, I don't think so legal journalism has faced the pressure for those eyeballs to go towards that direction here. Yeah? It's still nascent, and it's still discovering the domain in which it operates. But uh, I do see some signs that it may be in that direction. And that comes more from how uh, citizen journalists, uh, quote unquote, operate. And on citizen journalism, uh, there was a senior editor yesterday who did uh, point out opinion. He said that we don't have citizen doctors and citizen engineers. So maybe there's a need for formal training, which goes towards the professional function of a journalist as well. Uh, I'll request that. Uh, okay, just what? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I keep saying this, but no more after this. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Lakshmi, and I'm a lawyer. Uh, so my question is for I mean everyone on the panel. Uh, yeah, all of you have mentioned that there's very little when it comes to trial courts because we see more of appellate courts, especially the Supreme Court that is being 
given a lot more attention uh, and even in terms of live streaming and so on. Uh, so uh, th there are also reports that I know, for instance, Live Law does, uh, that I know the print does on empirical research and its findings from trial courts. Uh, so what is the impact that these um, that these reports have had? Like, do you think it has a wide reach? Are people interested to know what trial courts are doing? And are people interested in empirical findings? So I'll, I'll quickly say Print has done a fantastic story, a uh, series of stories about women in trial courts uh, as judges. Uh, and, that's, and also as uh, people who are within the legal apparatus, that's been great. And I think a lot of people are reading them. Uh, Apoorva, would you like to... So our experience has been that there's a lot of interest in these um, in these trial courts as well. And it's the same idea, right? Why did, why, why did we see a boom in people watching live streaming or following court coverages? Because finally the gates were wide open and there was this curiosity in people to just know what's happening inside those buildings, right? It's the same thing for trial courts and that's what we're trying to do now to open those gates and show as much as we can at least. And so, yeah, uh, in our experience, that is a wide readership and interest and curiosity there. Just adding to that. So we, Live Law, we had started a series for uh, highlighting the infrastructural issues in trial courts. So like wherever we could go, we took the pictures, everything, and we, we did a story, but we could not continue it due to logistical issues. So such kind of stories, they do generate a lot of interest. And at least people like who are higher ups, they sit up and take notice. And now infrastructural issues of judicial infrastructure, that is one of the, like, one of the highest priority issues for the judiciary now. So they do generate interest, that's true. And I'll just like to add, lawyers have time to wait before their cases are called out. And quite often, I see them scrolling a legal platform, if not playing Snake or one of the other games which are available on their phone. So I, I do think that happens in the trial courts as well. OK, uh, thank you so much. Please join us for the outside. Thank you.